Hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. We are an online resource community for up and coming screenwriters. And today we have a very special guest with us who I am thrilled to have, Clara Fernandez Vara. And we are going to be talking about writing for video games, mm -hmm. which I know is a topic that interests a lot of people here. Um, and so it's going to be. A ton of fun interests me too. <laughs> Adam, you're a gamer, so you. Uh, oh yeah, I've got some questions. I've got some questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to uh, start off by like telling us just a little bit about like your background? Like, I know you're at you're at, you're at Tish, and so I actually just gave a talk earlier this week. Uh, you know about what I've done, and it's very long, so I'll try to keep it short. But well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is really cool. Uh, I'm always happy to talk to people about, you know, what writing for games is, um, because I know that there is a lot of interest. Uh, I came to games, I was playing games when I was young, I guess, so since I was like seven or eight. Um, but it's not something that I thought of as a career. And um, I, studied, I studied media studies and theater and drama. And I actually took um, many years ago as a kind of fun thing to do a class on writing across media. So... Uh, I took a class on screenwriting for uh, film and television and radio and even advertising, um, you know, back in Spain where I'm from. Uh, and, you know, that's, I've always been study, I've always been interested in uh, storytelling and studying storytelling, uh, but I was also part of the theater group in my university. So, so it was this thing of like, I study something, but I also do it. That was always part of me. Uh, and when I started studying video games, which is another long story, um, you know, there was the curiosity of like how to make them. And, and I started by making uh, text adventure games and, and teaching also how to make those text adventure games, the, the smaller ones. Uh, I worked at MIT as a researcher for a while and I was making games for research and I made a bunch of uh, games for research. And I think that there was somebody who was playing Simon as part of the prep for the panel today. One of my yes. games from MIT. Yep. So thank you so much for playing it. Um, um, I hope that it worked. I don't know. I would love to. It see. did. Okay, so, great. It's a flash game. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Kaylin, one of our community leaders, um, they led a live stream where they were playing through Simon and all of us were watching. So it was it was really fun. It was really cool. Everyone was really impressed. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Everybody was really impressed and really enjoyed the whole design and had a lot of fun with it. We were all trying to figure out what to do together. It was, and then trying to like look at story moments and things like that. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, well, the best thing of that game is something that, you know, is something that we can talk about. That game, when you go back and play it again, it won't be the same. It is a completely that's, different game. That's what um, one Theo thought. Theo's here too. And she was like, I think that this means that it's gonna be different every time. So yes. Theo yep. was right. And there's that's a very so different cool. way of writing. And, and that's one thing that you know, a game writer should you know, learn. So yeah, well, I was at MIT, I was working on those games and games like Simon. And then, you know, when I finished my postdoc, I was like, what do I do next? And I worked as a writer, editor, copy editor, whatever they wanted me to do uh, for a while at Bitfish Games, uh, mostly on the hidden object puzzle adventure games. Uh, for a while. Um, and then I've been kind of, you know, in between, you know, academia, I keep teaching uh, now at NYU, at the NYU Game Center. Uh, I teach narrative design for undergraduates and uh, but I also work as a consultant uh, in different games. Uh, so, you know, I've worked on a game for uh, Warner Brothers, I've worked on a game for the Spanish National Ballet, and I've been working on other stuff that I cannot really talk much about. Um, but, you know, <laughs> what I do is ranges from writing, designing systems, um, you know, fixing dialogue, a bit of everything. Um, but uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is that I come from English studies, just like um, drama and film and media studies, you know, I come from the humanities. Uh, and I've learned a bit of programming. I, I'm not a programmer, uh, but I know enough to get my way around a program to know what to ask programmers and 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 to to kind of like be able to be hands on and on actually making games. That's so great. 
That's so exciting. Everyone here is thrilled in the chat. <laughs> and um, I guess, Adam, I'm going to move you to the wings unless unless you want to stay with us while we have this I initial stay. chat. I can go, whatever, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> um, Tell me where you want me. Okay. All right. I'm going to write see. some questions on the side for myself. Okay. Okay. All right. Here, I'll take you. I'll I'll do this for a bit, and then we'll have Adam come back. So, I guess to start, I'm wondering if there are any games that made you want to get into this field, like any games you played growing up or something that made you interested in narrative gaming. Um. Well, I played a lot of games. I think that Game Spot, like, there was a variety. When I was little, they were all very difficult and kind of broken. I think that now they, they call them massacre, but for me, there were games. I always tell the story that what made me interested in, in, in games as stories first uh, were the inlays of the cassettes uh, of the games that I used to play. So, so back in the day, now we download them from the internet, but back in the day, you had to buy a cassette that would come with an inlay and it would have the instructions. But at times it would also have the description of the game. And because you had to load it from a cassette, you know, you would connect the cassette uh, tape um, recorder to the computer, press play, hope that it would load. And that would usually take like 10, 15 minutes, depending on, on the game. So you would have time to read the manual. It's something that now we don't do anymore. <laughs> but but in the manual, they would tell you the story of the game. And that would give you the, the kind of background because the graphics were not great. You know, they were very pixelated. And at times you were wondering, what the hell am I looking at? <laughs> so with the inlays of those cassettes, um, my favorite example is a game called Head Over Heels. Uh, which was published by Ocean back in the day. It was for the Spectrum. I had an MSX Commodore. You can actually look it up online. And the, and the manual was telling me about all these planets and this, you know, the 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 the, the war uh, amongst these planets and, and what the characters that I was going to control were. Uh, and it was all written because these these games were like. You know, they had to be smaller than 48k. They were really, really small. And the email that was sent now is bigger than that. Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of like my inspiration where, you know, waiting for a, a, a game to load uh, and reading the manual and reading the story of the game and, and kind of like that's what helped me fill the gaps. Uh, but in terms of like games that have inspired me, I mean, I always talk about the LucasArts uh, point and click adventure games, you know, The Secret of Monkey Island, Sam and Max, Manic Mansion. Um, the Indiana Jones games are great too. Um, you know, Loom, I've written about Loom too. Um, all those kind of inform my design philosophy because this is not only about writing. We are creating worlds and we are creating opportunities for interaction. And, and those were the games that kind of inspired me the most. I think that, you know, that they were also kind of like a fulfillment of something that I had wanted to see in, in earlier games. I played text adventure games and what we call graphical text adventure games, which you had an illustration and you had the, the, the text and you had to type in what you wanted to do. Um, and I always found them very frustrating, first of all, because um, I was playing them in Spanish and what we call the parser, which is the part of the of the program that understands what you're typing and telling the computer was not really great. It was really, really dumb. Um, so, so you know, I always wanted to see that. And and the LucasArts uh, you know, point and click adventure games, you know, they were fun. They were really well written. They were fascinating worlds, and and they were very, very compelling. So, so that was kind of like part of the inspiration. The last thing would be like when I it kind of clicked that I could make them. That was actually already when I was doing my PhD, and I started playing interactive fiction. Uh, so those are the text adventure games, but in English, uh, things that people who are hobbyists and, and used to be hobbyists, but now they are in the games industry, they're, they're, they're game writers, they're narrative designers, and they started making this text adventure games uh, back in like the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and there was a, there is a tool called Inform to make these parser based um uh, text adventure games, and and that's where I started. That's where I realized, oh, I love playing these. The, there's so many experimental, really cool things to to play. So, for example, the work of Andrew Plotkin or Emily Short, 
uh, John Ingold, <laughs> uh, Sam Barlow, who are now you know renowned, you know indie and not so indie uh, writers. They started making these games. Um, and so it, it's kind of very typical to play these games and say like, oh, can I make these? And, and that's where I started. And, and it gave me kind of an understanding of how to actually make uh, narrative games. So yeah, I know that that's kind of like long, but it had like many layers to it. <laughs> no, it's that's really interesting. And honestly, when you were talking about the manuals, it reminded me not quite the same, but I would get the, the Pokemon games and in the car, on the way back to my house, before I could put them in, I would always just sit there and read the manual and get all excited. So I can kind of relate to that, <laughs> loving yeah, that I mean, part of it. People love reading like the, the encyclopedias of games, right? There's somebody who has to write all those. That is also game writing. You know, yeah. the, the lore, the Bibles, the diaries of games. Like there is somebody actually writing all those. Mm -hmm. I think that someone's vacuuming above me. So if you hear weird noises, oh, <laughs> that's what's going on <laughs> but no that's so cool I yeah and I loved like the guidebooks that had all like I would always wanted the guidebooks so I'd make sure to pre-order so I'd get the guidebooks it's one of the best parts <laughs> so I guess so at the end there you were talking a little bit about like what got you into video games and writing for games and I'm wondering what like how does the the writer of a video game collaborate with the game designers? Like what's that relationship or process like? It depends on the game. So this is the thing. Like there are many models. Uh, so for example, the kinds of games that I've made, they're always smaller and I have a lot more control. There are some that I've been working on now that you know I'm making them by myself. Uh, and I have friends who work on um, point and click adventure games, you know, like Wadget Eye games or Grandis Lab games, you know, those are very small teams, like one person, two people, you know, they might have like themselves, maybe an artist, you know, composer, uh, but it's like a, you know, one man show or one woman show or a very small team show um, because there are tools that allow people to, to make these games. Uh, whereas, you know, like I've worked on, on larger games or games that needed to ship really fast and there was, you know, there had to be like, more planning and for example i was not only the writer i think that one of the distinctions that maybe i need to make is that there is writing for games uh and there is narrative design mm. and i consider myself i've done writing for games so I've, you know, i'm a game writer but i also work in narrative design which is designing the game designing the world designing the interactions and also writing you know whatever text goes there but but also building the world as part of the storytelling uh, as a writer, for example, there have been times when you know I've come into a game and the story was already there, not really written by a writer, um, and you're given a list of uh, of scenes that you have to write. And if you know a bit about storytelling, you know it depends a bit, but it, it, there's a range. At times, there's like cool stuff that you can uh, work on, but at times it's like, who the hell came up with this situation, right? <laughs> things that I had to write uh, for a game was like writing the dialogue of a very grumpy book in a library who was scolding the player for being late and not being able to cover this uh, water break that happened in the room. And it was a way to give a cue to the player to find something to plug in a hole in the, in the room that, where they were. <laughs> like, how the hell does a grumpy, wet book why is but uh, i'm trying to remember what this was like why is but um uh you know like not uh not generous something like that um but this happens you know i i know there is actually a a game is it is the twine game called um the writer will do something that is also kind of the story of of what writers, particularly in AAA, like a lot of the pain that can go in, like, into bigger games um, because you you come in and there's the game going and, you know, probably even you know, our young screen editors already have experienced this whole thing of like, well, anybody can write. <laughs> I don't need training. I don't need to study because I can tell stories in the pub. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you come in and there's like a rough story and, and you have to write a cutscenes or write dialogue or like fix things because, you know, supposedly 
tax is cheap. Tax is cheap in many ways. So, so there's there's actually the the idea of like coming in as a writer. At times, you don't have a lot of agency over the story itself, but rather you thought of as content. Um, you know, and I have you know lots of very talented friends who who are like really great, and and you know they've come into those situations. I think that the industry is also changing more and more. There is you know, a, a wider audiences are now realizing that that games can also tell really interesting stories. So you see how there is more planning and, and now narrative designers and uh, writers are part of the pre-production of games earlier on rather than in the middle of the game or with, you know, six months to go, somebody thinks of, you know, oh, we should hire a writer to write these scenes, um, <sighs> which again happens a lot. So yeah, there there is a range. I mean, like there's also you know there's the um, the equivalent of uh, what in TV would be like a story coordinator. You know, when have a big AAA game and RPGs usually have to have somebody who's like the the story coordinator, the one person who knows what everything is and has to look at all the dialogue and 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 it's a lot of work because there's a lot of content in these games. So, so that's also another role of, of kind of like the story coordination. Um, some story-driven genres give um, their writers, well, more writers, narrative designers, a bit more agency. So, for example, uh, back in the day, and I think this is still true, Obsidian, you know, the the, the people who made uh, now is Outer Worlds, but you know, the Fallout New Vegas. Um, you know, like they had a different narrative designers designing sets of quests. But again, these are people who can not only write, but get into an engine and start putting things and and, and, and coding it a bit. Um, so yeah, the, there is a range depending on what one is looking for. There is a range of respect for storytelling, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the game. Uh, and there is a range of, of tasks and, and kind of, computer literacy, if, if that means anything, to, that, that is needed to, to work as a, as a game writer. Again, game writer, narrative designer, related people use it interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So speaking of like stories and figuring them out and, you know, in screenwriting, we use beat sheets and like tentpole documents and things like that. Are there any, is there any sort of tool or format or template like how do you create how do you uh, design your stories um there's no standard i get this mm. question all the time it's like oh what's the final draft of games uh, thing is games at times use final draft you know for triple a and to, to write cutscenes for example you can use final draft or a screenwriting program um but the tool that we use the most is spreadsheets. Um, we use spreadsheets to write dialogue, um, lots of dialogue. Uh, we use spreadsheets for a uh, description of objects. You know, that's when I was working for, you know, Big Fish Games. A lot of the edits and a lot of the rewrites happen on spreadsheets. That's all I used. At times, mm -hmm. I was actually using the code directly, and I, I'm I'm doing that now. Like there are some of my jobs where they just given me the code and I had to write dialogue in the code itself or like coding myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, so so in, in terms of like planning, uh, now they're happy to share a, a, a blog post that I uh, put together with a yeah. list of tools to write um, interactive narrative. There is a range. Uh, there are tools now that are kind of, you know, meant to be, for planning, so I know that Celtics, which has been a long, um, it was it used to be a free screenwriting tool 15 years ago, something like that, has become like a planning tool. So does RTC, um, but you know every company might have their own. Mm. Uh, depending on on where, one of the things that that I like uh, encouraging my own student uh, students to to learn is writing specifically like the one hour drama, like TV um, and TV writing rooms can be a good model for triple A because we also have Bibles. We also have like those those diaries and, and those encyclopedias that at times uh, people uh, it, read in game. They're probably the Bibles and, and documents that have been prepared to 
uh, work in a game and then that's like, well, we have all this, we can just show it into the game and people can read it too if they want. Um, so, so the, the planning, it kind of depends, you know, like at times for, for gig, big games, it can be, you know, having a story Bible or there's already a game concept and this about fleshing the world and then fleshing it at, you know, the, the equivalent of a beat sheet could be a list of missions, for example. You know, uh, mm. I've ha I've written the equivalent of beat sheets for for one of my own games as well. You know, also because at times you're working with people who might not um, be you know into games, so you have to kind of translate it into a document that they might they might recognize. Um, but there's times when you know, for my smaller games, since I know a bit how to use my tools, I just start writing um, for things like Inform for a parser based game. I might just start building a space and a world and descriptions. And then I come up with, it's, it's like, I'm just making it, it's kind of like tinkering, for example. So, so yeah, there is a range depending on the size of, of the, of the game. Uh, there's more and more uh, tools that are trying to get that kind of, not only like writing the, the story Bible and the story beats, but also keeping track of, you know, not only all that information, but how it plugs in the game itself. Uh, so that you can have, you know, similarly to how some screenwriting programs, you might have your index cards with your characters on one side. Um, you also have, you know, tools where you can have your 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 uh, index cards and then writing the interactive dialogue within them. Um, so, so yeah, it's like it, it can be a variety of things, depends on the company, depends on, on the size of the game. Uh, knowing screenwriting you know, conventions, knowing TV writing specifically is very useful for this, uh, but mm. also being familiar with, with the tools uh, to make interactive narrative of whatever kind is also a good way to kind of get that tool set and the kind of you know, things that you need to, to write for games kind of ready. That's great. So a question that came to mind when I'm trying to like visualize what it looks like that you're writing. So before you talked about like that you're like designing this world, when you're designing the world, is it like you're in like a document, like writing what it looks like? Are you actually like planning maps? Like how far does the, the, the narrative designer or game writer go? So it depends. I mean, like different people do different things. So for mm -hmm. example, in my case, you know, I might draw a picture. It's not even a map. I might mm -hmm. draw a picture of a room. Uh, or I might just start, you know, Informer allows me to do this. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start with the room. What does this room look like? What does it have inside? If it has an object, what kinds of things can I do with this object? Um, if there is a character, what will the character say? How will the character react if I say this other thing? Or if I try to do something to this character? Um, so, so it's uh, the thing with specifically in form is that you can write as, um, you know, like it's supposed to be, you know, natural language. So you're writing, you know, uh, a bedroom is a room and yet you've made it. Um, the description of the room is this, uh, the description of the bedroom is, um, you know, it's a, a disorganized room. Um, with very little light and that's you've already made it this is already there it's, it's code um but then there's other th things like you know the you know using twine or something like ink for example there are different tools where you're writing uh, you're writing closer to um you know kind of like an, an, choose your own adventure but you're writing close to a book and then you're giving options to the player mm. um, that's a pretty straight forward as well um yeah it, it kind of depends you know at times you know like I've, I've i've had my planning done and then for example i would have a spreadsheet with every single item that i wanted the, the, i want to have interactable in a room and what the descriptions are and what their properties are and that's where the spreadsheet comes from so so it, it, it really depends you know different you know different games are going to have different kinds of code that makes sense that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it also flows into what I remember that something you brought up when we talked about before, that you said that some a way that games diverge from screenwriting is that in a script, 
you know, there's only one thing this character is going to say. It's the thing they must say to keep the story moving forward. But in games, you reach a point where there's four things this character could say. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, like, how yeah, is- choice comes into the narrative. Yeah, choice. I mean, like, choice, narrative choice design is this whole discipline, and we could have, like, a separate talk if you want <laughs> or some other day, because that's its own can of worms. But, yeah, one of the things, you know, coming from screenwriting into games, I think that a lot of, you know, screenwriters who want to make the move into games, they see the AAA games, you know, the the Naughty Dog games, for example, that are very cinematic, and they have cutscenes. Uh, they feel like film right and and you can write them in final draft for example um you know and 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 they say like oh this is what i want to write and you know that is one thing Uh, and there are many games in which you know writing cutscenes or the descriptions of things something that is more i don't like the word static but it's kind of like is always going to be the same right Mm -hmm. um but yeah there's things like interactive dialogue or writing a story where the different choices are going to change the events of the story uh, and, you know, I always give the example of uh, a game called Alpha Protocol that is from 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. I have a very bad sense of time, but I think it's probably <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, where, you know, the, the, in, in, there was many years ago, there was a, there was a presentation, I think it's PAX East, where they were talking about, you know, how they wrote the dialogue for this game. And this is a spy game. Uh, and it's kind of similar to if you're familiar with the uh, Mass Effect, the Bioware games, where you can choose to be, you know, in, in, in each response, it's like you're either Paragon, like you're good, you're neutral, you're evil, or maybe something else, or opt out and don't do anything. And in Alpha Protocol, their shorthand to know what those different options were, where the, uh, the it was the three JBs, and it's a spy game so it was james bond jason Bourne, or jack bauer any (laughs) screenwriter knows that those three are very very different characters Mm -hmm. and what the hell is this you know like how do you keep that idea of like consistent character um and you know makes sense for a game like alpha protocol but for a writer that's a nightmare and think that that's the first thing that kind of goes out of the window at times, especially when you write interactive dialogue that, you know, if you, in, in screenwriting classes, a very typical thing to, that will tell you is like, well, you have to know each line. You have to know who is going to say that it, it, it has to be, that's the character who can say it and nobody else. And that's the thing that they should say is a very Aristotelian, you know, this is the, the necessity, you know, that's, that's what they have to, to say. And in games, you know, at times we don't, we want players to feel like they're in control, but they're not. And we're going to take them to the same place anyways. But what is the room that you leave for the player to express themselves? Or what is the room that you leave to, for the player to change the story? And, you know, like if you can write different options and there's not the Aristotelian necessity, like what are you doing here, right? And that is one of the main skills that, that goes against probably anything that they've taught you in, in screenwriting class is, is that idea of the, the opening up and, and that anybody could say, and not really anything. There's still a, a range, but that is way more often than, than what, you know, the screenwriting lessons or, you know, any dramatic writing lessons might, might have led you to believe. That makes sense. Do you think that, that level of choice, like letting the player kind of, live through the protagonist um how do you think that that impacts this kind of stories we can tell in a game versus in film i don't know if i said that right but hopefully you get- this is a range it's kind of as i said it's like there are many different stories there are many different kinds of games i think that for example there is a myth that says that you know things that because a game is first person or because we are controlling the character we immediately identify with them. And, you know, there are things that we say when we play games that are not even, you know, semantically, they're kind of questionable. Like, you know, uh, you're playing Mario and you fail and it's like, oh, I died. 
you don't say Mario died. You say I died. And I was like, it's the only t- the context that you would say that, right? It's not like, you know, Sunset yeah. Boulevard or, or American Beauty, right? It's gone like, nope, uh, I died. Like, you don't say Mario. It's like, it's me. Because I'm the, you know, the one who went down the hall, right? Um, but at times, you know, it's happened to me that at times I've been playing first-person games where I don't like the protagonist. Or they're talking like, I remember having this fiction with, you know, Bioshock Infinite, uh, my, by, you know, people that I know and some very dear friends of mine. And I just had so much trouble, like, con- connecting with this character. I was just yelling at him most of the time. Yes, it was a first person <laughs> game, but I found Elizabeth, you know, the, 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 the companion. She was much more interesting and, and, and I wanted to be her, right? Uh, but that's also something that you can do expressively that you can use expressively uh there are games for example um i love the game deadly premonition uh for those of you who are uh twin peaks fans um it drinks so much from twin peaks and david lynch is a delight um and deadly premonition uh, at least the first game uh the protagonist is talking to zach all the time and it just feels like you know, Zach is us and is not, it's kind of making this gap uh, between us and, and York, the name of the protagonist. And, you know, I'm not going to spoil the game, but I think that the idea of this game that is, you know, third person, we're not quite identifying with, with the character that we're controlling because he, he's talking to us. Um, so there's, there's so much that we can play with. There's so much that we can kind of juggle with that what is interesting is, is exploring that the expressivity of, of games. Um, we could try to make interactive movies. I think that for many years, people talk about the cinema envy of video games. But I think that, you know, the, what we have to do is like, you know, I love movies. I probably, you know, I'm, I'm a cinephile. Uh, I, I really love, you know, watching movies. Um, but, you know, there are things that games can do that, that movies cannot. And there are things that I go to movies for. And I think that games also have a kind of wonderful way of putting you in, in, the, in the shoes of somebody else. Or maybe not, you know, like, you know, a game like Papers, Please, for example, you know, you are trapped in this, you know, imaginary, you know, fantasy, uh, repressive dictatorship, and the dilemmas of your of your character become yours. Um, and if for people who might not be familiar with the game, you are a border agent, and you're the one who approves whether somebody gets through the the border or not. Oh, wow. And you have to check uh, their passports and see that everything is okay. And if their pa- their paperwork is not okay, you know, you don't let them in. But it's your choice. You can let people in if their passport is not right. But then there might be consequences. If you're caught, you, they, it, you know, you will lose money and then you cannot help your family and your family members might die or they might starve or you cannot get medicine uh, for them. So at times it's like, do I help this person? Like this person wants to get in, but there might be a criminal, but they're bribing me and I might be able to use the money to kind of make up for the money that I lose if I let them in. So all those dilemmas, you know, it's it's very interesting because this this game makes it so that if you comply and try to to play the game to win, you're also complying with the oppressive government of the game. Versus if you try to be generous or you want to help people, the game is over. So so I think that that is the kind of thing that, you know, movies don't quite do. Um, you know, they do other wonderful things. But that's one thing that the games can be very good at, at doing. And that is also narrative design. That is not just writing. Is the interaction. Is the way that the system of this oppressive government is what we're playing playing with them it's the kind of friction it's not only the words but the actions and and you know how fast you have to go through the passports um what is not only what uh, the characters tell you when they beg to get through is is like what is it what is the, the the system the balance of the system that will allow you to 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 make it harder and harder as time passes to to actually get it right or even to think whether you want to to help somebody or not
Um, so yeah, I think that there's like everything. It's like there is a range of things that that we can that we can find. Um, but it's, it's a matter of, of realizing that, yeah, games can be so much more than just interactive movies. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. You know, it, the game you were describing reminds me of this one that's name I've forgotten, but I played it on my phone and it was that you were like the super of this building and in like a repressive government. And it was your job to spy on all the tenants and decide who are you were going to report oh to the God, government. I haven't it played was so, it, no, but yes. It was really good. It was really great. And I enjoyed it a lot. Um, Beholder, Adam got it in yes. the, here, okay. I think Adam wants to come in. He's been, he was freaking out when you talked about Twin Peaks. And- uh, <laughs> I was freaking out when you talked about Twin Peaks. I uh, Papers, please. I uh, I love that game. No, no sorry, yeah. continue. <laughs> no, I wanted to bring you in. Um, yeah, we're almost- we're getting kind of like through our planned questions so pretty quickly. I have a question. I have a question. So <laughs> with this papers, please sort of brought up something about like, so for me that games like that, it feels like the story, the narrative design is completely integrated with the gameplay mm -hmm. objectives. And I feel like for me, that's kind of like not, that's a very alien concept for like a screenwriter who wants to get into video game. Like that's why people think that the oh, video game is game writing but not like sort of accounting for this narrative design. It was like, so from a screenwriter perspective, for me, like when I see, think of like stories and project uh, protagonists and like, oh, a character who wants to go after something, an, a video game character with an objective mm -hmm. seems like the most one-to-one -one sort of thing. Yes. Like, what do you think about that interplay of like characters who want things and a gameplay objective? It's yeah, kind of a I mean, big cluster question. Yeah, I mean, that, that is narrative design. That is exactly narrative design. Uh, you know, as you were saying, it's, it was funny because I had a, a, I went to a panel once and I was with somebody who was saying that Papers, Please was a light narrative game. And I was just so angry. I was just like, no, you're so wrong. <laughs> just because there was not a lot of text. And I'm like, that, no, you're just equating narrative with text and that's not true. But there's the drama. And I think that that's where as you say it's like the the motivations for the character it's a bit tricky to talk about goals because at times you can have the character's goals and the player's goals are different uh mm. so for example i believe it was uh, somebody who had either consulted or written for the god of war series uh and, and she was explaining how you know in god of war you have creators who's like really tortured and you know he's given this You know, oh. I think we lost you for a sec. Uh, which is already not. Oh, no. Oh, no. Could you okay. just repeat? You're back. Could you just repeat what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rewinding. Kratos. I was, you yes. know, I think that what happened is like I spoiled the game and then <laughs> the internet said, I don't spoil games. What are you doing? <laughs> Okay, so I'll spoil getting it. Maybe we will break again. <laughs> so, so yes. So in God of War, we have Kratos in the original game, and yes, the premise of you know him being so angry uh, is that you know he was tricked into killing his own family and he's tortured. Um, and again, you know, from a storytelling point of view, this is fridging. This is killing women and children for the sake of the motivation of a man. Again, in a cutscene, right? uh and you know i think that th th that's kind of copying not, not great things from from hollywood storytelling um so it's kind of like you know that's that's kind of like the motivation in the cutscene you know and you know we can we can you know almost give a break although again i'm i'm, I'm a bit kind of uh sensitive about fridging because it's, it's kind of becoming so old um but that's not what motivates us um you know that we want to be cool we want to you know kill monsters giant mythological monsters you know we want to be kratos because he's strong right because we want to get to the end you know and kratos is also tortured and, and having you know all these like personal issues and and i think that that's that's a, a lot of what can happen in games is that at times there is a misalignment and that's okay i think that that's one thing that we have to to be aware of that it's okay 
for for the player character to have a motivation and for the player to have a, a different one and seeing how they align or how they diverge. Um, I think that that's where there's and that interesting friction, that interesting drama. And as you were saying before, I think that, you know, the, the way that I present, you know, um, I, I teach a world building uh, workshop and the way that I present, you know, the how uh, traditional storytelling might line up with, with what you might know from dramatic writing and screenwriting is that you have a world and the world has conflicts. You know, the, you have the what I call environmental conflict that I know some people call, you know, man versus nature or why not woman versus nature or like, you know, person mm -hmm. versus, versus nature. <laughs> um, you know, that can be one, but there's also, you know, cultural conflict um, sociological conflict, you know, you know, this interpersonal conflict, this personal conflict, and all those are setting a story engine for whatever you do. Uh, what you do as a game is like, you can choose what are the kinds of conflicts that you're going to give the player, you know, why do we have so many post-apocalyptic games? Because they provide us with a lot of interesting conflicts, you know, from mm -hmm. environmental conflict, to you know information conflict what the hell is going on um you know social conflict this you know society is kind of disappeared or like it's crumbling so so part of what i call of my method of narrative design is precisely you know pitting the player against the the world and the conflicts of the world and what side are they in are they in one side are they do they have to choose um you know what tools do they have to deal with the conflicts of the world uh, so yeah, that that is part of the the overlap. In the same way that before I was talking about all these things that are completely different, that is part of the common ground that we have in games. It's really interesting. I I wonder, sort of going back to sort of this idea of like you know the protect like people seeing like oh I died versus the character died. Like how much of the story is you and the choices you make? Do you think that like the more choices are added, the less it's a defined character? It depends. The more choices are added from a developer point of view for a second, you know, changing my hat slightly, it's a nightmare mm. because, you know, after all, all that content, somebody has to produce it. That's why I worked on procedurally generated content for games because I was experimenting on like, can I teach the computer through a program how to create different content according to an algorithm? And I'm part of the narrative design comes from designing that algorithm. Uh, because yeah, like the, the thing is like the, the content can grow exponentially and, and you know, somebody has to keep track of all that. And it's also terrible to test. So it's all the nightmare. Um, but at times, you know, like we have things like, you know, role-playing games, and table, it, it's the same for tabletop RPG uh, and computer, you know, RPGs is very interesting because particularly Western RPGs, the kind of D&D school of, of tabletop, when you move it into, into uh, computer games, you can configure who your character is versus, you know, the Japanese role-playing games that give you a given character, you know, with, with an identity and a backstory. But, um, you know, a lot of the, of the um, kind of Western role-playing games, things like Fallout, but even, you know, something like Dragon Age, where they give you a backstory, but part of, of who you are, you choosing, you know, your race, your your you know, your stats and, and, and you configure your body in ways that we don't have control over your bodies. Um and and, and that's where we create interesting ways. Again, it's, it's a matter of having a good story engine and giving room to the player. I think that that's the 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 challenge here is like how much do we as writers uh kind of uh, control or limit the player and how much room are we giving them to have their own, to make, be able to make decisions, to have their own agency in the world and feel that they are the character. Uh, and again, that is one thing that is very different from, from traditional dramatic, dramatic writing. Depends on the... Oh. ...type of game, you know, can I... We lost you for one second. The, yeah. I think she okay. said, depends on the type of game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the type of game. Okay, yeah. I think the camera was like, oh, shut up. Just. <laughs> <laughs> no. Here's an interesting um, 
a comment from Theo that I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I find if I play a game as a created character, I make different decisions. My play in Dragon Age, like you were talking about, will be totally different from how I play Geralt. Which, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there's like at times, and this all depends on the player. You know, there are players who kind of take the cues and, and that's another uh, concept that we can take from dramatic writing and to screenwriting that's very useful. This idea of giving cues, that we're giving cues to players to interact, to know what to do. Um, because what players are is, is an actor without a script, which of course any actor will tell you that that's their worst nightmare going on stage and it's like <laughs> what do I do right and what we do as as writers and active designers giving them cues no this is what you have to do this is this is the range of things that you can do uh and there are some players that will you know abide or like follow your cues and there are other players that will try to troll it try to find what the limits of your world what the limits of your writing is um, you know, and that's also their fun, you know, so, so, you know, there's people who like role playing games and, and, you know, open world games, uh, and they like to experiment and there are players who like to be told what to do, or like they might be more into the kind of solving specific things, you know, is, is, is the kind of, uh, so for example, I, I love open world games, but I also love adventure games that are very much about, you know, filling a specific you know, following a specific path or or doing a specific set of actions as a kind of, you know, solving puzzles. Um, and and there are players that if you give them an open world, they're like, they don't know what to do. They're like, uh, uh, whatever, just tell me what to do, right? Um, so, so I think that that's, that's the other thing to take into account. But at times we talk about the player as if, you know, they were a monolithic thing. But in truth, there are many different types of players. There are many different types of motivations. Again, the difference between the character motivation and the player motivation. And, and at times we have to be aware, you know, who our audience is. This is not different from screenwriting, right? Um, so being aware of, like, what kinds of players might want to play this game uh, is also part of, of what we do as, as narrative designers and, and writers. I'm definitely the kind of person who needs a story. Like... <laughs> A lot of times when you reach the end of the game, they're like, okay, now you have free reign. And I'm like, I don't want free reign. I'm done. Um, <laughs> but that's... Uh, you don't want to go specific. and collect all the little magic stones, you know? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm there for the story. <laughs> so th this is sort of a tangential question, but like, I wonder what your thoughts are on... Well, not tangential, you brought it up earlier, but like game stories that can only be told in the video game format. Like, what do you think it is? What do you think, like, what games do you think tease at that now? Or like, do you what elements do you see in the future being developed in like really exciting ways that we don't necessarily have uh, in movies or TV? Um, I think that there is a, for me, I think that there's more and more of a, uh, literacy that's, that's developing, you know, by, you know, new audiences where people are used to making stories theirs and configuring their own stories or even filling the gaps. Um, so, for example, you know, like even games like Fortnite, for example, where you have this world and you have these characters and, and characters is what people connect with. I think that this idea of, of creating worlds where people tell their own stories um, you know, or, or where they enact stories with others, you know, the, the kind of the MMO space. We've seen, you know, fashions change every few years. So, so kind of trying to predict the future of games is kind of impossible because, you know, the, the fashions kind of come and go. Uh, but this idea of configuring the story um, and making the story yours, it can mean many different things. It can be being in a space, building stories with others and and as a narrative designer you are creating the opportunities for those uh for those stories to happen uh i'm very fond of games that leave room for players to figure out what's happened you know but right now i've been doing research on detective games for example and part of detective games you know that there is a kind of space where like you might not know what actually happened you know and, and i find that really interesting uh, i love a game for example like her story right where the interpretation of what's happened is up to the player, um, you know, and, and you can have your own reading. And, and I find that compelling, interesting. And, and, and I think that I want a bit more of that. Um, 
there's also a thing that, you know, I keep saying that there's going to be a comeback of the interactive movie. Um, you know, one of the, the things that happened, you know, the, a few years ago when Bandersnatch was first out, the reaction of the, of the um, games industry, many people in games, was like, well, this is not very sophisticated. This is bad choice design. And, you know, I, I, and I disagree with them, you know, being a games person, you know, first of all, because, you know, it is very smart uh, choice design for the kind of audience that they were going for. So, yes, there are really wonderful games out there, mainly indie games, honestly, where you have interesting choices and dilemmas and, and they're expansive worlds and they're great. You know, I love things like, you know, the, the Fallen London type of games, you know, Sunless Sea, Sunless Skies, you know, the Fail Better games. You know, I love them. They're also written by people who are, like, absolutely brilliant. Um, so it's like, yes, you compare that to, to Bandersnatch. And it's like, well, you know, Bandersnatch is an experiment. Bandersnatch is a, is a, is a story about choices and it's very meta in a way. It's very unstable. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, but it's part of the story, is part of the commentary of the story. And the thing I always say is like, look, if you say Bandersnatch, you know, before it, the, that episode of Black Mirror was released, not many people know the Bandersnatch was a, a 80s game that never got released and that actually caused this company to close back in, in the UK in the mid 80s, right? So nobody knows Bandersnatch, but now you can use it to talk about interactive t television and being able to have not only that level of cultural impact, uh, but the accessibility of being able to, to play a story from your... Um, you know, streaming platform is very powerful and, and getting to that kind of audience is something that a lot of games, you know, they're not that accessible and they're not that easy to pick up, um, you know, in, in the ways that like a lot of the, the games that I love can be very overwhelming to certain audiences. So I think that there's going to be a comeback of this like interactive TV um, you know, I think like TV and it, because of streaming, because of this kind of convergence of technology, um, you know, and, and it, it will die out like, you know, VR has had, you know, come back. There's going to be some that, are, that is staying because the technology is really great. And there's really interesting people working on it, too. But I think the kind of like explosion is kind of like dying out a bit on the next fad is going to be you know, interactive TV. And again, knowing more about narrative choice design, the kind of thing that kind of goes against, you know, everything that you learned in, 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 in film writing school. Yeah, you thing. should see the Kimmy Schmidt uh, interactive movie. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So if, if a screenwriter, like one of our screenwriters wants to get in to, for example, like writing for video games or writing narrative design or so if they just are starting fresh and want to get into it, what are some things that you would recommend that they do? So there's, there's two different things. It depends on what one is aspiring to. So mm -hmm. with the traditional screenwriting background, uh, one thing that is open, you know, like the, the, there are many AAA companies that routinely they they try to get people who come from screenwriting and that they're looking for junior, you know, game writers. Um, so having a portfolio that uh, shows that you can write, usually it's like you have to write in somebody else's world so that you understand the kind of game that they make, uh, that you can create a character that fits in that world, that you can create a scene. And I think that this is, you know, when things get tricky, you know, knowing how to create a scene for a game and, and it it's, might seem similar to how you would write it for film, for example, uh, but knowing what is possible with, with you know, within uh, digital tools is also important. You know, in the same way that when you write a scene for film, you have to take, you know, budget into account. It's like, is this filmable? Um, there are things that are easier than others in, in, in digital format, right? Uh, computers are not magic. Uh, there's usually some, you know, artist, you know, very talented who has to put it together. There's people who are in charge of putting the cameras in the game as well. You know, it takes a lot of time and effort uh, to put these, you know, amazing uh, scenes together. So, so that kind of, you know, mindful of of 
of resource budget, which is kind of harder to know when you're not in games. Uh, but the big thing for anybody coming from screenwriting is getting familiar with writing interactive narrative. Uh, I think that there was a mention of Twine already in the comments. By the way, mm -hmm. Bandersnatch used Twine as a prototyping tool, but I think that Netflix has their own now. Yeah, um, I think Theo mentioned that Life is Strange used Twine. Yes, I mean, a lot of people, and, and, and this is, you know, just to uh, vindicate this, you know, Twine is wonderful. Uh, uh, Twine also has a Patreon because the people developing it are not making, you know, a profit out of it. So so you should sign up for the Patreon because they are really doing an amazing job of giving tools that, yes, like AAA companies, you know, Netflix is using. So, hey, you know, let's, 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 <laughs> let's give them some money. Um, so, so apart from, you know, the, the, the small vindication there, um, you know, like knowing how to write interactively, something like Twine is very accessible. Uh, as I was saying before, Inc, uh, from Inkle Studios, um, and the, you know, Inkle Studios got a grant, I think from Epic to develop it further. Um, it is a bit more like code, but, uh, it's starting to, to make you understand how to write conditional dialogue, you know, what an if statement might be, what a variable is. And when you're writing interactive stories, if you know what an if statement, you know, uh, and, uh, and variables are, you're pretty good. You know, that, that's kind of like the basics of what you need to, that, what you need to know. Um, but also something like Inform uh, 7, you know, like Inform for me, you know, is, is a tool that teaches you a lot about how to tell stories through space, how to create you know, dramatic behaviors in characters and, and understand how difficult it is to to bring a character to life interactively. Mm -hmm. uh, we can write, you know, wonderful dialogue and then we can find a great uh, actor and like it comes to life. But when it comes to creating a synthetic character that we have to think about how they would react to things and you have to program all of those. Uh, so think that getting your hands dirty and actually you know, doing a bit of code, and I know that it's scary. I know that, that for some people are like, ah, the computers, I don't know. Um, they're not that scary. They're, you know, capricious, and, and you know, at times they might not do what you want them to do. But, but the difference is, that's the difference between just being a screenwriter that is trying to break into games, like a lot of other people, and really understanding what interactivity is and what um you know like making writing for a game is um and also like there a lot of the tools of the, that are available now to to make games you know they also give you an amazing sense of independence of like you know being able to create your own stories and releasing them to the public um and you know and getting that that um that practice uh, and it also shows, you know, a thing that a lot of companies are, are looking for people who understand the nature of the beast and, and know that if you put them in front of, you know, some XML code or JSON um, code, they're not going to have a heart attack and they can more or less read it. Uh, again, I'm not a programmer, but, you know, I, I know enough to know my way and, you know, fix things or, or know what to change or know what not to touch and not to break, which is very important when you're writing for games. Um, but yeah, I think that that knowing a bit, you know, of programming, also playing, you know, a lot of games. I think that there's people who want to break into games without playing them. Um, and as I was saying before, you know, for the big companies, one of the things that they always ask is you being familiar with the games that they make. Uh, that you know what their tone is, that you know what kinds of, I mean, it's not that much different from, you know, trying to get a job in a TV show, right? Show that you understand the TV show that you're going <laughs> to write for. Um, so it's kind of similar for games. But yeah, I think that the, the click is, is learn if statements and variables and how to use them in, in, in writing, you know, interactive passages, you know, that, and the tools are out just right there. I remembered as you as you were talking, I completely forgot that this was a thing I did in fifth grade. I made a game using Game Maker, mm -hmm. and ah, yeah. it was called like Mathematician Secret. You were a wizard solving math problems, and that was my fifth grade <laughs> project. Amazing. We use Game Maker in, 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 in where you're game centered. The game Maker is one of the tools that our students have to work with. Still around. Still really? Around. Yes. 
That's so fun. I remember I was able to kind of like just slob my way through it then. So yeah, it, it was a it was a tool I liked then. Um, by the way, to anyone to our audience here, we can now start like moving into other questions if you all have some that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet. Um, but we'll just keep chatting and I'll keep an eye on keep an eye on all that. Clara, what do you what do you think about uh, games like Dwarf Fortress that are just like yeah? What do you think about that? <laughs> so I love them. So the things like Dwarf Fortress is my kind of thing, uh, but I've read more about Dwarf Fortress and the stories that have come out of Dwarf Fortress yeah. than actually got to play it because I never found the two hours that I needed to actually figure out yeah. the damn game. Um, but that is the kind of game that I was talking about before, you know, that is really complex. So for, for those of you who know, don't know what Dwarf Fortress is, it's an old game. Now it's old. Um, yes, yeah, like 2006. It started. Um, but it started as a, it's, it's, it's an ASCII game. It's like, it's all text. It, the graphics are all made with letters. And it's got its super complex, wonderfully emergent uh, world where your decisions, you know, like your your mining society and you're creating the history. It's, it's kind of like a strategy game, I guess, you know, if you've played Civilization. But the system is mostly, you know, to cre that creates these dynamics. You know, it, it is a strategy game where, like, the stories that come out of it and, and the stories that players have written about them playing Dwarf Fortress is, is are really really amazing uh but it also requires a kind of devotion and investment um that you know i for example like and i love this kind of idea but i'm just like i don't have the bandwidth to deal with this game uh but i love <laughs> i love reading what other people have done with it and and i love that you know th this is an example of how procedural generation can change the way that we think about storytelling because where it's narrative design with narrative designers of worlds that are alive uh rather than telling one story as you know as storytellers we're used to creating worlds or or going into a pre-existing world and creating you know the story of one set of events that is you know that we were predetermined predetermining but here as a narrative designer is really excited to create whole worlds and that players find their own stories and then those stories can be also read by other people or watch and like think that you know streaming no not that you would stream door fortress i don't know if i could i don't think people should do that <laughs> <laughs> um, but but this idea of like the the story as you're creating it or as you're experiencing it and then other people watching it um the sims you know one of the successes of the sims was that yes there were all these emergent stories that that players could make happen you know and that was the, the the investment but part of the hook of the sims was also watching what other people would have done and the web pages that people would create of the stories that had happened with their sims right so, so i think that there's those those two levels that you know i think they're very exciting as, as a storyteller but again like they require thinking about worlds of systems and this idea of the story engine and 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 Kind of thinking a bit more computationally on the one hand but also kind of like seeing what what the system of your world is um that are very different from from not that they're very different but it's kind of like a notch up from how we understand world building in other media well, i think we have some questions here if you want to raise some alexi so one that i realized that we that I forgot to circle to before um, that I was originally going to ask is, what's it like to pitch a video game? Oof. Um, not like pitching a TV show or a film, let me tell you. Um, it depends. So for people who are new, pitching a video game usually entails at least making a prototype or what people call a vertical slice, which is you know showcasing all the features of your game of the first part. So so yeah, it's not that you pitch an idea. You have to pitch that you can make the game. Um, so so yeah, it's not that you're going to say like, oh, I have the greatest idea. Just give me the money to make this, um, because as the thing that the, the a lot of labor. 
Um, and, and, you know, the, they are just looking at, you know, the, the, the capacity to deliver a game and for you to finish a game because making games is actually really hard, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I, my husband who's also a narrative designer talks about how, you know, it's not really, if you're a narrative designer, it's, it's like, you're telling a story, you're building a rocket at the same time. <laughs> Uh, and, and you're know, programming and like getting the computer to do the thing that you want them to do. At times, you know, it's temperamental and they might do something that is not what you thought. Um, so, so yeah, the idea of being able to deliver and, and you're not pitching just the idea. Everybody has ideas is the, this is what I've been making. Give me more money to, to make it. Uh, there are people who might be established who might have a track record and say like, hey, I've been making these things um, you know, give me money to to make a new one. But even then, I mean, I, I think that, you know, back in the day, one of the most interesting stories that I heard was from the original Bioshock made by Irrational Games. And they had to make a demo. And these people had a track record and they had, you know, the shipped games. And they had, and they had a completely different concept for Bioshock. So if you want to read something really interesting, look for the uh, pitch document for, uh, the original Bioshock, and it has nothing to do with what Bioshock ended up being. Um, and it's actually like you can look at uh, pitch documents for for games. Um, uh, I believe the Planescape Torment is one of the ones that I've used. I think Fallout, you know, some of the the RPGs. So so a bunch of those are available online. Uh, but yeah, for Bioshock is very interesting because the story premise is very different. You see some brushes there you see that, yeah, that there was a level that was underwater, but it was a very, um, very different story. But the core mechanics and the way that it was presented, you know, like about the ideas, it's, it's about the core mechanics. Um, but yeah, I think that the, it's, it's, it's different. It's also different when you're pitching a game, uh, for example, to a game publisher uh, or people who are already in the games industry is very different from pitching a game to Hollywood uh, that you're going to make a game based on their IP uh, because you know, like those people in you know, TV and film who don't know much about games, if at all. Um, you know, this has happened to me. Like that, you know, talking to people in in you know in, in, in Hollywood who think that all games are like Candy Crush if it's mobile and, <laughs> and you're like, no, there's a bit more variety than that. So, so it, it, like everything, you have to know who your audience is and, and what they're looking for. But yeah, if you want to pitch a game, like I have a genius idea, you might have a genius idea, but actually being able to, to implement it, to deliver it and finish it, you know, it is really complicated. So they want to see a kind of track record that you can actually do it and you understand what, what it takes. So this question is kind of connected from Theo. Is it worthwhile learning something like Unreal or Unity, or would it make sense to stick with Twine or RenPy? I don't know if I said um, that right. RenPy, because it comes from Python. RenPy, gotcha. Ren yes, it, it is tricky, because I used to say that until I realized, oh no, it's from Python, the, the language. Uh, it depends. I think that you can start with Twine and RenPy, in, in, in a way, like RenPy is actually not a bad option because you actually have to learn Python, which is a programming language. Um, so, so whatever you learn, you know, is good. Uh, Twine and, and RenPy are more accessible, and I would start there um, so that you can feel like you can do it. Um, and then if you get brave, it's like, yeah, something like Unreal and Unity, but you have to feel confident, confident about, you know, your programming. The, the thing is that there is a lot of tutorials now, and there's a lot of materials that allow you to, to learn it. But uh, the, the thing with engines is that they're usually designed to make something very specific. And the moment that you might have an idea for a game that is not exactly what that engine was for, or that you know that that engine is making assumptions about what kind of game you want to make, you're going to run into into a lot of issues. So so like yes, Unity. I believe that there are tutorials for Unity to make you know looking for the specific type of game that you want to make and going through that tutorial and like at least understanding you know, how it works. But the thing that is starting with Twine, you know, Ink again, I think is is great. Uh, RenPy is another good option. Um, you know, that, that that can make it, you know, it's a kind of like gateway 
into at least understanding it. I know, I know, um, you know, game writers who don't know Unity or don't know Unreal, but they also have noticed, for example, in the last few, you know, couple of months, that there is a need for narrative designers who know Unreal, um, because Unreal doesn't have tools, specific tools for implementing dialogue. Uh, it's more of a technical role. Um, so, so they're looking for somebody who can write and program at the same time. Um, and that can be a bit challenging, but there's people who like really get into it and, 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 you know, like learn the ropes, the, the more you can learn the better, but yeah, uh, learning at least, you know, any of the choice based kind of games, you know, twine, you know, Rempi, Inc. And again, I always recommend Inform7 just as a way to also understand programming in a way because it can get more complicated. Um, you don't need to go into into Unity or Unreal, um, you know. And if you have to, you know, you usually do it on the job. They kind of drop you. It's like, okay, now you have to put your dialogue into Unity. Yeah, yeah that's how you do it. So we had a, a follow-up question about pitching and just like the specifics of that. So if if you've never done it before and you want to pitch an original idea, would you say that you have to show up with like a working prototype or demo or something? Okay. Yeah. It's like if now, and there's tons of people, you know, like now that you know, wild conferences have been off, you know, this hasn't happened, but you know, the game developers conference in San Francisco, which is this huge meeting, you know, there are people who just spend the whole conference not really attending any of the presentations. They just go around with a laptop, usually go to a hotel lobby. That's the other thing. It's like, um, you know, I've pitched uh, games myself and I had my prototype and, you know, it's nothing like, you know, going into a meeting room and a projector and like giving. No, it's like you're going to a hotel lobby, which is usually very busy and very loud. And you have your laptop and you're trying to make people interested in this thing that you've done. And you might be sitting in a very uncomfortable chair and and there's a lot of things going on and is the least like pitch that is the opposite of of what a the, what people imagine a pitch is but but yes yeah, like you pitch in a bar you pitch in a ho like the hotel lobby that there's uh, the 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 lobby of the marriott in in san francisco next to moscone is just people with the laptops you know talking business and showing games mm -hmm. uh, but yes yeah, it's not just an idea you have to show that you can make the game that makes sense. So, okay. Yeah, totally. Let's see. Here was a specific question for you. Very specific. I'm a digital game design graduate. I also minored in screenwriting. Currently I'm planning my master's. I believe creative writing would be the best way to go for a narrative designer. What do you think? I mean, like anything that is, you know, game design and writing you know, is, is going to be good. I still think that, you know, uh, creative writing can help you in terms of building worlds and stories. Um, but I, I think that knowing more about screenwriting and more than feature writing, actually TV writing um, is is very specifically much more relevant. Or like, I think that we, we mentioned this in the, in the prep, you know, like uh, animation, you know, the way the animation works, you know, the, it's very... It's interesting to look at the how animation has been written over the years, and how uh, games, you know, work. Like animation didn't have screenwriters; it was the the animators themselves that came up with the stories. Like in many games, the stories were, you know, written by their programmers. Uh, there's the rare exception, like Roberta Williams, you know, being the one who wrote the stories and then going to her husband, who was the programmer, and said, like here can I, I want to make this uh and you know she was able to do that we cannot do that as easily now but you know it, 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 she was she was doing this um so so yeah like this idea of of you know being able to um to kind of like get other people to to make your game or to tell tell your story you know it, it's it's you want to have as much independence in being able to to make your games so so i think that you know knowing how you know the, the idea of the story engine you know like in tvs uh, tv writing is that you are setting up a world where 
you know, depends on the show, right? There are shows that know where they're going to end for Robot. You know, they knew where they were going to end, and when they finished, they have this amazing, powerful, like, yes, this is amazing writing. Um, but in games, you know, that this ability to think about potential stories and, and creating worlds uh, where you're writing episodic content, you know, like the, there's more and more games where you, we have episodic content. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's why like TV writing may be more similar to what we do in games than creative writing. But whatever you do, man, honestly, like if you're in games, um, you know, we have students who come from architecture. Um, we have students, you know, I always say that lawyers, people who come from law and go into games, tend to be really good game designers because they know about <laughs> writing rules and trying to bend the rules and <laughs> so, whatever is in your creative bag, you know, is, is, is good. You know, painting, history, you know, have students who minor and do very different things. Some of them minor in computer science, but some of them like go get a minor in philosophy, history, um, child psychology. I had a recent graduate who did that. So, you know, whatever, whatever is going to help you give you tools and give you material uh to work in games is great you know the, the problem is when people just stick to you know being very passionate about games and nothing else you know mm -hmm. uh like just that doesn't give you material you know yet there's many games existing but if, if if all you like is games is is like you know it 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 just became it just becomes making games about games whereas you know i don't know if you like hiking and going out in nature like you know imagine the kinds of games that you can inspire you know like things like breath of the wild for example um or if you like i don't know uh painting or you know like i think that um there was the yoshi game let's say yoshi's woolly world where the inspiration came from one of the hobbies of the director of the game she liked knitting and crocheting and that was the inspiration for the game. So anything that goes into your bag, it's the same for screenwriters. It's like you have to live, you have to have other interests, and you, know, you have to have a world so that you can draw materials to put into your creation. So yeah, just, you know, whatever. Creative writing, great. As you know, as, as, in terms of skills, TV writing is more, uh, you know, will help you more, but whatever is, is, is like skills and like material and, and Things that are good for your soul too, you know. That's great. I'm, I'm remember, remember. Uh, I remember this Shigeru Miyamoto quote where he actually said he doesn't like hiring gamers yep. for that exact reason. It's like he wants people to have life experience, that ideas outside. Because yep. how can you break the rules if you're just trying to remake uh, an old game? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, that's you know the the there is a story about you know how Super Mario Brothers you know comes from you know the this inspiration like being a kid and going outside and jumping over brooks and things like those and that was his inspiration right so so yes yeah, like it's it's at times it is a problem to just you know make games about more of the same some of the most interesting games out there maybe i'm biased but you know i mentioned you know things like deadly premonition it's like yes this is a love letter to twin peaks oh my god um but that's why the lot of you know that's why i love it Adam, do you have any more questions written down? Oh yeah, uh, but we don't have to go into them <laughs> if you've got some here. Um, no, I, no. My, something I always think about is sort of like how much like violence is like a functional, like almost re required aspect of like character, the player character interacting with their world, and, like mm -hmm. being tied to their concept. Like why, not, not so much why there are so many violent games, but like, I wonder, like how people can move beyond that into different types of ideas and different types of objectives that aren't just okay now let's give another character a gun who has to shoot 100 people to get to from point a to point b yeah, yeah like i feel like there's a lot of that <laughs> well there's a stereotype that video games are all violent and it's like well there is a section right. but you know we have you know puzzle games we have you know many different genres we have you know strategy games you know Right, but even Mario is killing turtles, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is the thing. Like, if you killed it all, because they kind of go back and forth. They burn, I don't know. 
poor Goombas. The Goombas, we don't know. I think that he smashes them and I, I disappear. <laughs> uh, well, if we're thinking about Mario narrative terms, it, you know, I always say it's like, okay, so why does Mario pick up these coins? Is he trying to, you know, get the ransom together to rescue Princess Peach? Is that about, you know? Um, but one of the reasons why it's, it's not so much like violence, but it's physical uh, actions um, because mm -hmm. they're immediate and there is a kind of immediate feedback about what you're doing and on what the reaction of the world is. So physical, you know, I always talk about verbs in games. We talk a lot about what the verbs of a game are. What are the actions? And yeah, a lot of the actions tend to be jump, run, pick up, shoot, punch. It's all visual because at times, you know, what are those verbs that might not be as evident or give you that immediate feedback but there, there is a possibility to have different verbs so this is why you know part of my interest in detective uh games part of it is because it's a story driven genre uh, but also because you know part of the one of the main verbs is explore you have to talk to people to cross question them those are verbs too um i always give this example uh, from a fan translation of a game called Portopia um, Serial Murder Case, which was uh, a, a game, is a detective game, and some people say that it might be the first visual novel. Is a longer story, um, but one of the one of the verbs of the game is ponder. In one of the translations of the game, is ponder or think, and that is a it's a it's a verb that you can click on, and is the hint system. Your character, uh, you click on ponder, and your character says, "Like this is what I'm thinking," and that is a verb. Um, another reason why I like interactive fiction is because you have to type uh, the actions, and and the actions that you carry out. Some of them are very physical, uh, but you can invent verbs that might be think, that might be you know kiss. For example, as a verb, we don't have enough games about kissing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. instead of punching, why don't we have more of that? Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite verbs in, in a game was playing um, Little Big Planet for the first time and having a button that allowed my little character to stick out their tongue. And I'm like, this is a <laughs> thing. does it have an effect on the world? No. Does it make me happy? Yes, very. <laughs> and also, because it's a multiplayer game and you can stick out your tongue at other characters and you're like, ah, like, you can go like this. Ah, and that's great. You know, those are <laughs> the thing that, that what we're missing is thinking about the actions. You know, the verbs of the game is going beyond physical actions and more, you know, things like explore, infer, love, you know, as a verb, um, you know, empathize. You know, there's there's so many that that are underexplored. Not that there aren't any uh, examples of it, but I think that they're definitely underexplored. That is such a wonderful way of putting it. I'd not think of thought of it that way. I, you know, it's kind of reminds me of like the best log lines have verbs that represent the central action of the story. Mm -hmm. Like is Sherlock Holmes investigating, you know, yeah. like that seems like there's a cor uh, correlation there. Um, mm -hmm. We have some that more also, questions, right, Alexi? Or sorry. I was gonna say that also just, it, it's a cool way to think about games. Like if you looked at a list of verbs and you're trying to come up with an idea, just being like, have I seen a game that does whatever? could be an, a fun, maybe that'll be a writer's room project. We have people pitch yeah. a game burst on a, based on a different verb. Yeah. There and you then go. Before, you know, Adam was mentioning Miyamoto and, uh, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto is one of the people who was advocating for verbs and finding new verbs. You know, it, it mm -hmm. is a shorthand that we use a lot in, in games because verbs define the kinds of things that one can do in a game. You know, look, uh, this is an exercise that I do with my students. It's like, okay, what are the verbs of Sherlock Holmes? What are the actions that he carries out? And why, what list of verbs will we give that would allow people to know that this is Sherlock Holmes? You know, like, you know, playing the violin, smoking the pipe. Um, you know, cross-questioning is like, yes, he interrogates, he examines with a magnifying lens. Uh, he does, you know, he experiments with chemicals. Um, he knows random trivia. Uh, but like you know, that exercise of defining a character through its actions, I mean, that's not so different from how we define characters. I mean, this is in a way is a very elementary way of, of defining it. It's quite like folktale way of doing it. But 
you know, I always mention this this note that F. Scott Fitzgerald had in one of his of his notebooks that was saying, you know, action is character. So so we look at the actions as game designers, as narrative designers, we are selecting those verbs. And those verbs are action. You know, they're things that we define and, and narrow the kinds of things that players can do. That's so cool. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think while I am shocked that it has happened, we are coming up on the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, I wanted to end with asking about what some of your favorite stuff is that you're playing now or have played recently. Um, uh, I'm kind of behind on things. I'm planning on catching up, but the in the last year to well, I mean, there's always Kentucky Route Zero, which everybody should play, and it's wonderful, and it's um, amazing, and it's hard rendering, and it's, it's great. Uh, so Kentucky Route Zero, everybody play it. Um, I think it's a landmark in, 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 in game design. Uh, I love Disco Elysium. Um, I've been waiting for that game for, like, 20 years. Um, that started <laughs> as a that started as a role playing game, and that's how they build the world. And you know, for, for everybody here, if you're a screenwriter, just note that several people that I know who work in, not only in games, but like novelists and screenwriters like being um, DMs in tabletop or playing games. Uh, it's a thing because it allows you to be able to generate stories on the fly. If you've ever been a DM, is very typical that you plan your campaign and then you bring in your friends and your friends want to do something completely different and you're like, oh crap, and you're inventing <laughs> things on the fly. So tabletop role playing games, very good exercise. It's good for you, not only to know how to play games, but yes, you know, I forgot to say that, but yes, play tabletop role playing games. Whatever you do, whether you want to write for games or something else, really great exercise for your brain. Uh, but yeah, Disco Elysium has a fascinating um, world um you have stats it's a, it's a role-playing game but it's plays more like a like a adventure game and your stats are a, like are beings that talk to you and when you're trying to do something they're kind of discussing with you um because it's all trying to model how the brain of your character works uh it's just fantastic um it's yeah probably the, the best role-playing game in the last you know 20 years wow um, so so yeah like for, for me it's like it, i was waiting for something like that for a long time um and then uh i actually wrote a blog post about this because i found it really touching that um there's a game called spirit ferret where you are somebody who takes over uh what's the name of the character karan like the 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 mythological figure that um takes dead people to the afterlife in in his uh in his boat so he retires and it's up to you to bring people to the other side. Um, and you have your boat and you're gathering all these souls and you help them reconcile with their pasts and their, their um, you know, their, their traumas and what's happened to them. And you nurture them and you do nice things for them. And then when they're ready, you have to let them go. And, and, and it's, it's a game about death. Uh, wonderfully written wonderfully animated um again wonderful narrative design because this was it, this is a game about you know it's, it's about letting go like you are c constructing this boat and you're making these characters you know making them feel at peace and when they're at peace the thing they have to do is saying goodbye and you know it's, it's really wonderful and that is again i think that maybe the, the games that i like the, you know, the last few years, like they do have wonderful writing, but there's also something about what my role is in the story, something like in Take Root Zero, you know, you're constantly changing characters and you're kind of from outside and you're kind of configuring what the, the story might be, but there's something very human and very specific about all these characters that just, you know, lodges into your heart. Uh, and I think that, that Spirit Fair had that effect on me, maybe because it was the middle of the pandemic and I was you know, it just clicked for me and, and, and it was ju just really wonderful because it was, it is a painful game. It is a game that is, you know, very nice in presentation, wonderful music, wonderful animation, but it's really tugging on your heart. It's really challenging in terms of, it's the opposite of this idea of like, 
being overpowered. You know, this is a management game and a strategy game to kind of, you know, make your boat, you know, thrive and grow things. But in the end, you have to really let go. And I think that that was like really, really amazing. That's so cool. I'm definitely going to check out all of those. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for coming and talking to us, Clara. This was amazing and thank made me so want to write video games, which was interesting, but now I definitely want to do it more. Um, <laughs> well, I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, and in um, <laughs> this has been really fun too. And hey, if you want to have some other session, just about choice, like narrative choice design, which is its own kind of worms, you know, happy to come back. It's really cool. That would be amazing. We will definitely take you up on that. <laughs> um, and if anybody wants to check out uh, Clara's blog in the description, we have a link to her website, and you can check it out there and get more information. Um, yeah, everyone's saying thank you in the <laughs> in the comments. This conversation blew my mind. Thank you so much, Claire. <laughs> Thank you for so, listening. I always, I always feel like I can just keep walking, like talking forever. So, so yeah. That's a talent. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I guess it's obvious for people who do writing for a living, but but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, and um, for our viewers next week is June, so we're releasing a new lineup of coffee class topics. The first one that we're doing is, we're gonna look at Saint Maud with Avi. Avi's coming in and we're gonna look at that and I'm gonna be terrified. So you, Adam and Avi are gonna have to break it more than me because- Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again and uh, we'll see everybody next week. All right, bye everybody.